The year is 1970. Both Monday Night Football and All My Children premiere on ABC television. Hamburger Helper and Orville Redenbacher's Gourmet Popcorn first appear on supermarket shelves. And finally, Casey Kasem's American Top 40 radio program debuts on LA radio. It's hard to imagine now, but that show was kind of a big deal if you were a young kid into pop music at the time. I have to wonder if jokers like myself would be on YouTube doing our little top 10 countdowns today if it wasn't for Casey. Just a quick note, I have already done a top 10 albums of 1970 video, but I've decided to go back and do 10 more. It seems to be a very popular year for viewers of this channel, and quite honestly, the wealth of material available more than warrants a second video. But just as a heads up or a reminder to those who saw that video, here are the first 10 albums that I chose for that year. I really love you and I mean you The star above you, crystal blue well, oh, baby, my hair's on and about you. Okay. Sid Barrett, and particularly post-Pink Floyd Sid Barrett, is not for everyone. This music is raw, unpolished, really unfinished in many ways. But that's not surprising when you remember that this is music created by a guy who was losing it mentally at this point. It's generally believed that excessive LSD intake permanently altered Sid's psyche. But on the other hand, Sid still had talent, and I think the combination of those two factors makes for some really fascinating listening. I thought long and hard about the best word to describe Sid's music, and I think unguarded is the best thing I could come up with. There are times where we almost feel like we shouldn't be listening to this, like reading someone's diary. And this effect is heightened, I think, by the inclusion of things like studio chatter in between the takes, a great example being If It's In You, where we hear one take quickly break down kind of hilariously when Sid's voice cracks. He sounds like an adolescent whose voice is breaking. But then he bears down, tries again, and gets it. The album is filled with gut-wrenching moments. For example, Dark Globe, where Sid wails out, Wouldn't you miss me at all in the chorus? He could be speaking to an ex-girlfriend or possibly even his ex-bandmates in Pink Floyd. I'm also a big fan of Golden Hair, which is an old James Joyce poem set to music. In Joyce's poem, he hears a pretty girl singing nearby through the window and is transfixed. Lean out your window, golden hair. I heard you singing in the midnight air. My book is closed, I read no more. Watching the fire dance on the floor. Another one of my favorites is Late Night, which closes the album. It contains the line, inside me I feel alone and unreal, which is really moving when you think about what was going on with Sid at this point. He gives us a series of descending major chords in the verse. He starts on B, I'm capoed on the second fret for vocal reasons, but it's B major, A, G, and E. And I love what he does with the vocal melody. I'm sure it was all just intuitive. I really think Sid was an intuitive musician who didn't really know what he was doing at all in technical terms. But over the first chord, B, the melody features a fourth prominently. But then over the next two chords, he uses a sharp four, which is a great effect. Very nice. 
When I woke up today and you weren't there to play, then I wanted to be with you. When you showed me your eyes, whispered love the skies, then I wanted to stay with you. Inside me I It's a marvelous night for a moon dance With the stars up above in your eyes A fantabulous night to make romance Neath the cover of October skies Moon Dance is Van Morrison's third album and it was a very important one for him commercially. His previous record, Astral Weeks, which was the first he recorded for the Warner Brothers label, had not sold very well, although nowadays it's looked upon as an undisputed classic. I featured that one in my top 10 albums of 1968 video. But Moondance was an immediate success, both commercially and critically. I've always enjoyed Morrison's lyrics immensely. He has this amazing ability to evoke what one writer referred to as natural wonder, and the sort of spiritual experience that we can have in the presence of nature. There are many examples on this album. Into the Mystic is a great one. And Moon Dance, by far the album's best known track, which is a song about romance, but the natural references are everywhere. We get the stars up above, October skies, the sound of the breeze, the leaves that are falling. And of course, musically, I think the obvious jazz influence is what really made Moondance take off. That hadn't been done much at all in pop music up to that point. And I think it lent a certain air of sophistication to that tune that really appealed to the average pop fan. The verses are based on two simple minor chords, A minor to B minor, very reminiscent of the solo section of The Doors Light My Fire, which in turn Ray Manzarek admits to have pinched from John Coltrane's version of My Favorite Things. Everything comes from somewhere. And of course we have And It Stoned Me, another great track in which Morrison describes a childhood fishing expedition as a sort of natural high. He talks about getting drenched in the rain, then the feeling of drying out again in the sun, going for a swim, drinking fresh clear water out of a stream, and it stoned me to my soul. Half a mile from the county fair, and the rain came pouring down. Me and Billy standing there with a silver half a crown. Hands are full of fishing rods and the tackle on our backs. We just stood there getting wet with our backs against the fence. Oh, the water. Oh, the water. Water. Hope it don't rain all day And it stole me to my soul Stole me just like jelly roll And it stole me
And that, of course, song one, side one, from the debut Black Sabbath album, the song that I think most would agree pretty much invented heavy metal as we know it. Now, believe me, I know that's a rabbit hole that can go very deep. Clearly bands like Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple had initiated some of the elements. And later on, bands like Judas Priest and Metallica made further refinements that define heavy metal as it is today. But I think this is where all the main elements became present for the first time, both musically and lyrically. So what are those elements? First of all, we've got that riff. It uses a power chord. Now, power chords had been used a lot before by bands like The Kinks and The Who, but Tony Iommi's guitar tone made this much heavier, as did Geezer Butler's bass and Bill Ward's drumming, I might add. Second, and maybe most important, the use of the flatted fifth or tritone. This note just sounds evil. There's an old story about how one of the popes in the Middle Ages basically banned the flatted fifth because it was the devil's note. I don't know if that's true or not, but it wouldn't surprise me. The sound of that note... <laughs> precise, he's trilling from the flatted fifth to the perfect fifth, which makes it all sound even more creepy. And what about the lyrics? What is this that stands before me? Figure in black, which points at me. Turn around quick and start to run. Find out I'm the chosen one. Literally everything about this album contributes to the dark, heavy mood right down to the cover art, that ghost-like figure of a woman, so creepy it scared the hell out of me when I was a kid. Something I've talked about before on my channel is how prolific many bands were back in the 60s and 70s. A mere seven months after the release of Black Sabbath came the group's second album, Paranoid. I featured that one in my first top 10 rock albums of 1970 video. In all honesty, I think it's a stronger album than this one, but the first has to be recognized for being the first. And there are still classics on this thing. Another one is NIB with a riff that sounds a bit like a precursor to Iron Man from the Paranoid album. <laughs> think for many others, this album and its follow-up, American Beauty, are the two crown jewels of the Grateful Dead catalog. Here's where they began to move away from the psychedelia a little bit and cultivate what one writer called Americana-style songcraft, and I think that's a really good description. I can point to three very important developments within the group around this time that had a profound effect not only on this album, but on the band going forward. Number one, Jerry Garcia purchased a pedal steel guitar while on the road in Denver, Colorado, and began to incorporate it into the band's music. Number two, lyricist Robert Hunter, not a performing member of the band, went on the road with the group for the first time which streamlined the songwriting process. And finally, but maybe most importantly, Stephen Stills of Crosby, Stills & Nash fame spent an extended vacation at dead drummer Mickey Hart's California ranch. And during that time, he and David Crosby apparently initiated the dead into the mysteries of singing vocal harmony. Several dead members credit them with this which I think is really significant. When I think of the Grateful Dead, one of the first things that comes to my mind 
are those vocal harmonies. Not exactly what you would call tight harmonies, but very cool in that sort of loose dead style. The album contains two of the dead's most enduring and iconic tunes, Uncle John's Band and of course Casey Jones, which we heard a bit of in the intro. Now I've long been a fan of Robert Hunter as a lyricist. I included him in my first top 10 rock lyricists video. And I'll repeat here what I said there. He had this uncanny ability to write lyrics that could have been written today or 150 years ago. But I think my favorite of all might be Black Peter, written from the perspective of an old man on his deathbed. His friends and family have come to see him, but for them, it's just another day like any other day that's been, as the narrator says. So what can they say to a man who's dying? They end up talking about the weather. Peter repeatedly makes oblique references to his future state. Just then, the wind came squalling through the dark. But who can the weather command? Well, not a dead man. Fever roll up to 105 roll on up, gonna roll back down. Again, when he is no longer with us, yes, his fever will come down. One more day, I find myself alive. Tomorrow, maybe go beneath the ground. All of my friends come to see me last night. I was laying in my bed and dying And it burned on from saying Cosmos Factory is the fifth studio album from Creedence Clearwater Revival. And it's one of those albums that transcends simply being a hit and pretty much dominated the charts for a time. Six of its 11 tracks were released as singles and every single one of them made it to the top five on the Billboard Hot 100. It spent nine consecutive weeks at number one and over the years has been designated four times platinum. Pretty amazing. Credence was a bit of an aberration in the rock world of the late 60s and early 70s. While many bands were doing extended, drugged out jams and protest music, these guys were generally content to crank out more traditional, concise rock and roll. But on this record, they did flirt a little bit with some of the trends of the time. You've got the opening cut, Ramble Tamble, an extended jam that clocks in at over seven minutes long. And lyrically, there are at least a couple of tunes that could be interpreted as protest music. Many have assumed Run Through the Jungle was about the Vietnam War, although Fogarty has denied this. And then there's Who'll Stop the Rain, which I've always looked at as John Fogarty's Blowing in the Wind, a subtle reprimand against the powers that be. I went down Virginia seeking shelter from the storm. Caught up in the fable, I watched the tower grow. Five-year plans and new deals wrapped in golden chains. And I wonder, still I wonder, Who'll stop the rain? And finally, you've got what is probably my favorite tune on the album, Looking Out My Back Door, a bouncy little track with wild dreamlike lyrics that many assumed must have been drug inspired. Tambourines and elephants are playing in the band. Won't you take a ride on the flying spoon? 
That was assumed to be a reference to a Coke spoon. Wondrous apparition provided by a magician. Do, 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 looking out my back door. But in the end, Fogarty revealed that it was written for his three-year-old son and was inspired by a Dr. Seuss book. There's a giant doing cartwheels, statue wearing high heels. Look at all the happy creatures dancing on the lawn. Dinosaur Victrola, listening to Buck Owens. Do it, do it, do looking out my back door. Tambourines and elephants are playing in the band. Won't you take a ride on the flying spoon? Do a do wondrous apparition provided by a magician. Do a do do looking out my back door. Roxas was Santana's second album. It was Santana's first album to hit number one. And let's face it, it's really the definitive Santana album after all of these years. You ask the average person to name the most iconic Santana tunes, and you'll probably get Black Magic Woman, Oye Como Va, possibly Samba Petit, and they're all here. Regarding the album's unusual title, there's a quote on the back cover of the album from the Herman Hess book, Demian, published in 1919. He's appeared before on my channel. His books have influenced quite a few rock and rollers, surprisingly enough. The quote reads, We stood before it and began to freeze inside from the exertion. We questioned the painting, berated it, made love to it, prayed to it. We called it mother, called it whore and slut, called it our beloved, called it Abraxas, which still begs the question, what is Abraxas? It appears there's a few different meanings, but the one that seems most applicable, a Gnostic deity personified from the second century AD and considered the source of divine emanations. So I can see where creative types might be attracted to that. In the case of Hess, he applies it to an apparently extraordinary painting, and Santana seems to be applying it to his music. The band were performing Oye Como Va from way back. It's a Tito Puente cover, of course. Apparently, it was really good for getting the crowds dancing. I don't care what kind of band you play in. If you can get people dancing, you're on the right track. Samba Petit, by far my favorite Santana tune. Just such an emotional piece of music. And then, of course, there's the cover of Black Magic Woman. Great tune written by Fleetwood Mac's legendary guitarist Peter Green. Santana had seen Green perform at the Fillmore in San Francisco and decided to do the song. Both guitarists were big fans of B.B. King and play in very similar styles. The song could best be described as a sort of Latin blues. There's a nice little twist on this. A typical blues follows a one to four to five progression. This one goes from the one straight to the five, the one being D minor seven, and then straight to A minor seven, back to the D minor seven, and then to the four chord, G minor seven. It's a nice touch. Got a black magic woman. Got a black magic woman.
not time to make a change Just relax, take it easy You're still young, that's your fault There's so much you have to know you'll Find a girl, settle down T for the Tillerman is one of those rare albums where you look at the track listing and it sort of reads like Cat Stevens' greatest hits. You've got Wild World, Father and Son, Hard-Headed Woman, and on and on. Now, Stevens was an art school student, although, <laughs> then again, what British rocker of this period wasn't an art school student at some point? It kind of seemed like the thing you did while you were putting your band together to fill in time. But he actually designed the cover for this record, and it's a great cover. It looks like it could be the cover of a classic children's book, which I think is the kind of vibe he was going for. Now, a moment ago, I had mentioned Father and Son, and we heard a little piece of that great tune in the intro. In 2020, Stevens remade this entire album including a version of that track with modern day Cat, of course now known as Yusef Islam, singing along with his 22-year-old self, which is a really cool idea considering the lyrics of that song about an older man imparting wisdom to his son. It's not time to make a change. Just relax, take it easy. You're still young, that's your fault. There's so much you have to know. Find a girl, settle down. If you want, you can marry. Look at me, I am old, but I'm happy. I was once like you are now, and I know that it's not easy to be calm. And then there's the bittersweet wild world. Youssef has stated that this song is actually not about the end of a romantic relationship, which is what I'm sure the vast majority of us had assumed. Rather, it was a cautionary tale written to himself about the cutthroat music business. Personally, I've always interpreted the lyrics in a much more literal way. One gets the feeling that the narrator is older, maybe even what we might call sort of a sugar daddy. Lines like, hope you have a lot of nice things to wear, just remember there's a lot of bad and beware. We get the feeling that the woman who is leaving is maybe a bit young and naive and about to get a hard dose of reality. Now that I've lost everything to you, you say you wanna start something new and it's breaking my heart you're leaving. Baby, I'm grieving, but if you wanna leave, take good care. You have a lot of nice things to wear And a lot of nice things turn bad out there Ooh, baby, baby, it's a wild world It's hard to get by just upon a smile a child secret that George Harrison was a great songwriter who had the misfortune of being in a band with John Lennon and Paul McCartney. So as a result, he struggled to get more than maybe one or two songs on a typical Beatles album. So it's probably no surprise that his first solo album post Beatles breakup would be the musical equivalent of a dam bursting a monster three-record set just packed with great tunes. Great songs like Isn't It a Pity and the title track were submitted for inclusion on Beatles albums, but didn't make the cut. Those are head scratchers. Some writers have interpreted the album's cover, showing George sitting on the lawn at his estate in Escher, 
surrounded by four garden gnomes as a statement on his independence from the Beatles. I had never thought about that before, but I guess it's possible. The album marks the emergence of George's signature slide guitar sound, which would remain a major factor in his music all the way through his traveling Wilburys days. The album was co-produced by Phil Spector. And you know, as much as I appreciate his role in the history of rock and roll, I often find his work to be a bit too heavy handed and this is no exception. Some of these tunes, I think, are far superior in their stripped down versions. A classic example being All Things Must Pass. A demo version of that tune was included on the Beatles Anthology 3 compilation released in 1996. And it's by far my favorite version. It's just George and a very clean electric guitar with a nice tremolo effect. <laughs> A very underused guitar effect, in my opinion. I love the chord progression. It's beautiful. It's a simple progression. It just runs up the E major harmonized scale, but he includes strings one and two droning on top of all of the chords, so it really ties it all together. E major, now F sharp minor, but the inclusion of the B and E strings make it F sharp minor 11. Then G sharp minor augmented fifth and up to A, beautiful. And I love the lyrics. They're very calming in chaotic times. No matter how bad things get, don't worry, it won't last forever. All things must pass. Sunrise doesn't last all morning. A cloud burst doesn't last all day. Seems my love is up and left you with no warning. It's not a gonna be this great All things must pass All things must pass away Wow, anyone who heard that for the first time and didn't know anything about the Kinks would probably assume that Ray and Dave Davies came from the hills of Appalachia and not the North London suburb of Muswell Hill. That's some pretty authentic sounding stuff there. From the Contenders, the opening track from Lola versus Power Man and the Money Go Round Part 1. Incidentally, there never was a Part 2. But have no fear, this is definitely a rock and roll album. The hillbilly mood is quickly shattered by the appearance of a riff that sounds like it could have come from a Led Zeppelin or Cream album. <laughs> This is one of the great rock and roll concept albums, probably right up there with anything Townsend did in The Who. It's a satirical look at pretty much all facets of the music business. The band take on publishers in the track Denmark Street, music unions in Get Back in Line. Remember, the Kinks were forbidden from touring in the U.S. for a few years by an American music labor union. They take on the press in Top of the Pops and accountants in the Money Go Round. In Money Go Round, Ray Davies paints a very bleak picture of the type of thing that happened to so many unsuspecting rock and rollers who got chewed up by a brutal music industry. Robert owes half to Grenville, who in turn gave half to Larry, who adored my instrumentals. 
And so he gave half to a foreign publisher. He took half the money that was earned in some far distant land, gave half back to Larry, and I end up with half of goodness knows what. Can somebody explain why things go on this way? I thought they were my friends. I can't believe it's me. I can't believe that I'm so green. And of course, I'd probably be remiss if I didn't mention Lola. When all is said and done, it will probably be the Kinks' most remembered tune. I think we all remember the first time we heard it. We thought we were hearing just another tune about a guy meeting a girl in a bar. But by verse 2, it was becoming clear that this was no girl. Well, I'm not the world's most physical guy, but when she squeezed me tight, she nearly broke my spine. Oh, my Lola, la 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 la. Well, I'm not dumb, but I can't understand why she walked like a woman and talked like a man. Oh, my Lola, la 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 la. Of course, John Lennon bearing his soul as he does throughout this entire album, singing there about his mother who passed away when he was quite young. Great vocal there, so emotional. And those of you who know this album know that by the end, it gets much more intense. It evolves into basically a series of primal screams. At this point, John was undergoing primal scream therapy under the tutelage of a guy named Dr. Arthur Janov. Anyway, like it or not, you've got to respect the ballsiness of that move to put that on an album, especially in 1970. I think many of us are used to hearing screams on albums these days. But this was pretty radical back then. For me, Plastic Ono Band is undoubtedly the most honest and intensely personal album probably ever released. From Mother, you've got things like Working Class Hero, which is essentially John singing about himself, I think. In many ways, the Beatles were the ultimate working class heroes. He drops a couple of F-bombs in the lyrics, once again, we wouldn't even blink an eye on that today, but in 1970, that was pretty shocking. As soon as you're born, they make you feel small by giving you no time instead of at all till the pain is so big you feel nothing at all. And the refrain, a working class hero is something to be. They hurt you at home and they hit you at school. They hate you if you're clever, and they despise a fool. Till you're so effing crazy, you can't follow their rules. A working class hero is something to be. But I think maybe the most incredible thing about this album is, in spite of all the misery and vitriol, we still get moments of incredible sweetness. The song Love probably being the best example. Let's take a closer look at that one. As usual, John comes up with a great progression. We're in the key of D. Right away, he moves to the three chord, F sharp minor, and then to a secondary dominant, C sharp seventh. John likes that one. He uses it in Sexy Sadie and I think a few others. It's the five of three. And like most secondary dominants, 
it goes back to its one chord, so back to F sharp minor, the three chord. Then another great dominant seventh chord, which John loves. D7, so moody. I mean, how beatly is that change right there? Then to the four chord, G major. Five chord, and he throws on the classic little embellishments. A7 sus4, A7, A7 sus2, A7, right? How many times have we heard this move, but it's so effective. And then back to the one. Love is real. Love. Love is feeling. 